Good morning from uh, Hong Kong. Good morning. Uh, I'm Alice Mong, Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center. I am so delighted to be back with you. Uh, it's been a long, it's been a few months, uh, well, actually over a month since I've had a chance to host a program like this. And I'm really delighted that I, uh, to this morning uh, here in Hong Kong, uh, that we have this um, uh, book program, Interior Chinatown. For those of you who have not read the book, I highly recommend it. It won the National Book Award, um, I think, in November of last year, and we're really delighted that the author, um, Charles Yu, is with us this morning from uh, California. Charles, welcome. Um, let me give a quick uh, bio of uh, Charles. Charles Yu uh, is an American writer. He's written four books, and in Terra Chinatown, his fourth book. Um, and he is, he lives in, in, he, I think his last book was How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional War Universe. And his latest book, Interior Chinatown, as I mentioned, uh, won the National Book Award for Fiction and was long listed for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. Um, he's a graduate of University of California at Berkeley and majoring molecular and cellular biology, uh, minoring in creative writing. He obtained his JD from Columbia Law School. And we he's also, um, I guess he gave us the law job and became a, a writer for um, a television. And we're going to ask him more about that. And uh, so, Charles, welcome to um, Asia Society Hong Kong. Um, so delighted to have you here with us. Um, hello? Okay. Hi. Hi. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, Hi. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, I, I was just waiting. Uh, no thanks. problem. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, thanks okay. for having me. Um, Charles, I wanted to start off by asking you, and I know you, 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 you in the when did the first the book come out, and um, when was it first published? It was published January twenty eighth of two thousand twenty, uh, so which you, was a very interesting time. A lot of things going on that moment. And um, what was the kind of the impetus of the book? What made you um, because you were already writing for television? Uh, that was your day job. What um, you know? What made you decide to write this book? Which was it, what's interesting is written in a kind of script um, a form. It, it's, it's not your regular. Um, or, and, and I have to confess, I, I uh, listened to it on Audible, and it was really interesting. So, what made you decide to do the book in in that particular format? Yeah, um, you know, a couple of things. I I had been writing for television for a couple of years. I had previous to that, I had worked. Uh, as a lawyer for 13 years and I had published three books during that time. And I'd started writing this book uh, and it was very, you know, it was a very long process, a lot of dead ends. I, 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 I probably wrote at least two full drafts that ended up just getting scrapped because uh, they weren't working. And at some point in the process, when I had started working for television, I think, um, you know, in my subconscious, I started to, idea started to bubble. And uh, eventually it sort of just kind of fell out of my head. <laughs> this, this character, Willis Wu, who's this background, he plays a background Asian on a show called Black and White. So basically, you know, he is a uh, kind of every man uh, representing generations of, of Asian actors in Hollywood who, who never get to say much and, and so he doesn't really have a part. He doesn't have any lines. He doesn't have a story. And, you know, through Willis, it just felt like that a lot of things unlocked for me. And so that, that, that's kind of how it came to be written as a script because he was an actor. And so a bunch of creative choices sort of flowed from that. And what's really interesting is you you base it uh you know this chinatown you created this chinatown and you had said the chinatown is almost um a creation it's not based on any um, chinatowns so how, how did you um uh, tell us about this chinatown of your creation yeah I, yeah it's funny because when i told my mom my parents are from taiwan and uh, when i told my mom what uh what the book was about she her first thing she said was uh what do you know about chinatown i was like uh so i i said not much i had to explain to her you know i had read this book um by bonnie sui who's a american a chinese american author i think she's chinese american um uh called american chinatown which is a great book if anyone hasn't read it 
and it, it talks about five different Chinatowns in the U.S., Las Vegas, Honolulu, L.A., uh, San Francisco, and New York. And um, it was just fascinating. And it, it sort of w- was the basis for a lot of the ideas that kind of found their way into the book. I'm really indebted to Bonnie's work. And, you know, I, I think the idea with this Chinatown in the book, in my book, is it's, it's both a real place and a kind of cultural place. You know, it, it's supposed to ultimately be like a composite of um, both sort of what it feels like to be Asian American in some ways and what the representations of Asians are in Hollywood media. Uh, so, you know, meaning like what Willis in the, sh- in the book is trapped in this kind of Chinese restaurant, Golden Palace. And it, it's sort of like, imagine if you were trapped in, an, in a show from the 1980s, which is filled with bad Asian stereotypes, you know, where everyone's either doing martial arts or um, is delivering food. And so th- those are sort of the only roles that are available to Willis and the other Asians. And th- that's what this Chinatown is. It's sort of like a bit of like a uh, cross between a mental and a physical place. It's interesting you mentioned Bonnie. Uh, when the book came out, I was the um, I was at the Museum of Chinese in America as the director. And I think we interviewed her for that book. And uh, and also at the same time, I think that Lonely Planet did a documentary about the, kind of the, all the Chinatowns around the world. And it ended <laughs> with Hong Kong. And uh, in the documentary, the Lonely Planet documentary, they called Hong Kong the, the largest Chinatown, which I don't know if it was meant to be a compliment or what. But in some ways, I, I see elements of it. Um, but uh, but the so you didn't grow up in Chinatown. You grew up. Um, where did you grow up? And, and so the creation of Chinatown, your mom's question was very interesting. So where did you grow up? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I grew up in Los Angeles in, you know, first in kind of the West side of it, uh, a place called Mar Vista. And, uh, then we moved kind of more into the suburbs later. And so my, you know, the Chinatown closest was, or what I thought of was Chinatown wasn't sort of the downtown LA Chinatown. Uh, it, it was Monterey Park or, you know, San Gabriel is places where we go eat on the weekend uh, and, you know, go eat yo tiao or, you know, just like eat, you know, eat breakfast uh, if we're lucky. So that, that's, um, that, that's really kind of it. You know, I went to Berkeley, so I spent a little bit of time in Oakland Chinatown um again mostly to go get boba or something um so it 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 had to be a lot of research and just sort of imagination um my my wife and her family are from the east bay in northern california and she did kind of grow up in oakland chinatown um she spent a lot of time there going to chinese school and staying with her grandma who lived there so you know i had some stories both from my in-laws and i I had TV, you know what I mean? That, that, that was really kind of, it was sort of the mix of those two things that I was interested in is like the real lived experience of people, but also just as much the representation of those people and how much it was flattened by TV, how much we just saw, you know, this kind of very strange distortion of, of Asians, you know, I, growing up in the eighties and nineties, I, I very rarely saw Asians on TV. You know, and so it was notable whenever I saw them. But when you did, it was often accompanied by like this feeling of almost embarrassment because it's like, oh, there's an Asian on TV and look what look what they're look how they're portrayed. And um, I want to kind of bring in Hong Kong here a little bit. And because the influence 80s, um, I grew up in the States in the 80s and I remember my parents would um back then was videotapes, getting videotape of programming from uh, Taiwan. My parents are also from Taiwan. I grew up, I was born in Taiwan. So getting videotapes of uh, uh, television shows from Taiwan, I mean, that was their connection or from Hong Kong. Um, So how did your family have that? I mean, what was the connection with uh, Asia? Your parents left uh, Taiwan, uh, but when did they leave? And what, through um, I know we didn't see tele- the same thing growing up in, in, in the Midwest, you know, um, I think rarely seeing um, 
uh, Asian characters, you know, on television. So did you have any type of that influence from Asia in terms of, you know, um, uh, some of these images or, 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 you know, and let's talk about uh, the most famous uh, uh, Chinese American actor, uh, Bruce Lee. So did that have any influence on you? Yeah. Um, you know, my connection was, you know, um, it's interesting. My parents came from Taiwan in the 60s. Uh, my dad in 65 and my mom a few years later in 69. And um, I didn't go. So, And they, you know, they, they I, I think probably just out of necessity, didn't go back for a long time. They were studying, they were working. So the first time that I went back, or went to Taiwan was when I was, I think, nine. So like in 86. Uh, and I don't know that my parents went back before then. So it must have been something like 20 years for them. Um, so that was a big trip. And I, I was pretty young, so I don't remember a whole lot about it. But I remember like riding on the back of my great uncle's scooter <laughs> through an alley so narrow that I was like, oh, my God, he's like a 70 year old man riding. But he was like very skilled at <laughs> riding a moped. Um, and just all the relatives I had, I was like, wow, this is such a, you know, and, um, and then I didn't go again until I graduated college. Uh, I went on this kind of three week tour that was, I think, a sort of alternative to Love Boat in a way. It was, I was wondering, it was, I was going to ask you about the Love Boat question. But. <laughs> <laughs> I had friends in college who went on Love Boat and it sounded like a lot of fun, but uh, I, my parents were much more about me trying to, I think, um, well, I, I, they, they, I guess through some family, fr family friends, they had this kind of uh, arranged this group of us that went on a bus around the island for three weeks. So that was a really memorable trip as well. Um, but yeah, in between, I didn't go. And I actually have not been back to Taiwan. I've been to um, Shanghai and Hong Kong uh, for work as a lawyer. And I, in neither case did I see much of anything. I saw the inside of a hotel uh, and, you know, a little bit is my fault, but a little bit is like, there's not really time because you're there. You know, I was working as a lawyer, so you're, you're there to work and build, <laughs> build time. Um, so yeah, that's, and, and, you know, my, my parents, especially my dad, um, you, you know, it, after he retired about 20 some years ago, he started to spend half the year in Taiwan. Um, and so that was really interesting for us uh, because I, I think it was really neat to see how happy he was um, after all those years of not being there. Um, and I forgot there was a second part of the, did you ask a second part of the question that I'm missing? Uh, Bruce Lee, the influences Lee. Of, <laughs> of the, you know, the television or, or, uh, or, who influenced, I mean, did Bruce Lee influence you? Uh, because he is such a kind of iconic for a lot of us Chinese Americans, um, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, he, he did. Yeah, I remember watching Fists of Fury and uh, Chinese Connection. You know, I can't remember how we got them. And the like, bootleg or they must have just been from like the video store. But uh, um, and it's like, who is this? You know, I, you've been watching... American TV and cartoons up to that point as a, you know, American kid, you know, and I, all of a sudden it's like the coolest, baddest person you've ever seen. And I think it had a, a both superficial effect of like, wow, you know, that amazing. I, like he's a hero on the level of like Superman or, or, or Michael Jordan. And, and then on a deeper level, I think, or maybe it's not that deep, but uh, on a different level, it's, there was a kind of weird, like, unearned secondary confidence that you, that I got, you know, anyway, I'll speak for myself of like, well, I'm not as cool as Bruce Lee, of course, but if there's a, if there's someone like that, who at least sort of looks like me, then maybe there's hope, <laughs> you know, like, he, his coolness can kind of reflect he, he's he has so much excess um awesomeness that he sort of reflects it on 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 the rest of us and so he was he, to me he was a, like a superhero i guess yeah well uh we had his uh, daughter uh, who spoke at the hong kong international literary festival uh last year um and she's written a book about her father uh, or, or kind of his philosophy so here in hong kong uh, because you go to the museum here at the heritage museum there's a huge statue of of Bruce Lee kicking and you know he is in kind of 
part of Hong Kong, he, you know, and as well as America, he's buried in the States in Seattle. So I, I, I you know, he, he kind of influenced um, a lot of uh, Asian, not just Chinese American because the film was so popular. And, uh, uh, you know, I think he, it, ironically, he has to kind of come back to Hong Kong to make it big. Uh, because he, even in Hollywood, he couldn't, you know, he couldn't make it. Uh, um, I think you were probably too young for Kung Fu. I remember growing up watching Kung Fu on television with uh, uh, one of the characters. David Carradine. Yeah. And uh, so so it's ironic that he had to come back. But, you know, he, he, his film, uh, kind of like Jackie Chan's, uh, also um, has kind of had this influence uh, on, on, you know, not just Asia, but I, I'm interested in Middle East and parts of the other parts of the world um and and but die too young i guess um but yeah. um i wanted to now talk about a little bit of your you know you, you talked about your your um uh your parents but uh interesting when i was watching one of the interviews your mom was in the audience uh when yeah, one of your early book talk uh, in california with all i'm sure a lot of her friends were there very proud and but she asked a really interesting question and which is the question i want to ask you uh she even asked you know, why did you want to be a writer? I think she seems surprised um, at you because you kind of, your career seems very, tip, I hate to say, typical uh, Asian American, you, you uh, molecular biology, you went to Berkeley, um, uh, even though you minor in creative writing, but you uh, also ended up uh, at law school, Columbia, uh, and then practiced law for, for you know, over a decade. And she seemed surprised um, that you became a writer. And how did she, did you come, you know, you became a TV writer first and then, then you were already writing your novel, but how did your parents, you, you, they were proud of you as being a lawyer and all that, but how do they handle that? And that, that question of how did you become a writer? Yeah, that's a, <laughs> um, it, it was, you know, yeah, it's a very strange path when you look at it. Uh, and it's because it's not really a path, you know, it, it only looks like a path in the, in retrospect, I think, um, in the moment, it just feels like, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> what am I going to do next? What am I going to do with my life? Uh, so I went to Berkeley, um, and I started out taking some engineering and computer science classes because my dad is an engineer or was, and, uh, so I thought, well, maybe I want to be an engineer. And um, that was too hard. So I stopped that pretty quick. Um, I knew I wanted to write. So pretty quickly, I was applying to Berkeley does not have a creative writing major or didn't when I was there, but has a, a minor. So you can take these workshops and, and get a, a minor in English. Um, and I so I started to apply for those and I got into a poetry workshop. Um, taught by Ishmael Reed, and I was just like, oh my God, I get to do this. This is amazing. Uh, you know, I think my parents were a little worried at that point. Like, oh no, does he think he's going to become a poet? <laughs> like, I hope that's not his plan. Uh, so there's a little bit of consternation in the household uh, that I might have artistic ambitions that were not very practical. Um, I ended up finishing Berkeley with a major in biochemistry. Yeah, molecular and cell biology is what they call the major there. Um, and I applied to medical school and I didn't get into medical school. So, uh, which was very disappointing. That was a, that was a bad few months in my, in my house. Uh, when, and, and, you know, it's hard to get in medical school. So I thought, and, and I knew people that didn't get in that applied reapplied and ended up going um so that was one possibility but i think this i knew then like this is a sign i should not be a doctor no one should let me be a doctor uh uh but but also i for some reason i also wasn't interested really in writing any more poetry at, at that point I, I i just thought i was a little scared i thought what am i going to do with my life and 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 this is i think goes to your point alice is, is uh, i i do have a very i think i took a, a very conventional path in the beginning I, I was, my parents are immigrants, you know, and they had worked really hard and I, to, you know, live in this, you know, nice area where I could go to a good high school and uh, they'd sent me to Berkeley and I felt like, well, I have to contribute, you know, I have to be a responsible person. I have to at least be able to take care of myself. And um, 
so I went to law school <laughs> and uh, I think it was a, I think I'm a pretty risk averse person um, in some ways. I think day to day, I'm pretty risk averse. And that just seemed like a really stable thing to do. And, and I ended up doing it for a really long time. You know, I think my parents were, um, you know, I think they were happy. They were really happy when I told them, you know, my first book was going to be published. Um, but there was never really any thought that that would become a career. You know, there, there wasn't enough money in it for one thing. So, so I, as I published books, you know, they, they, they were very proud, but uh, it wasn't really until the TV thing came along that, it, it, there was any thought like, oh, would I, would I actually change jobs, change careers? When you did change career, um, how? Another question I was curious: How did the TV uh, writing for TV came about? Because you were already a lawyer, um, and like you said, had a, a steady check, a paycheck, your steady job. How did you switch? I mean, it seems to me, writing for television is still kind of. You were talking about being risk averse, but that's really um, taking a. a, a taking a chance and how did they take it or your uh, and your wife i mean was it a, a did you see that as a, a, a big leap um going from quitting your uh, uh, law job and then uh, lawyer uh, and then being uh, um, you know writing for television how yeah. did that transition came about yeah it was that was a big one um uh yeah i think you're you know i i, I I'm risk averse day to day. And then, and then I do something like that. <laughs> That's what's contradictory. Man, I think people are full of contradictions. And, and I, I just think uh, it's, it's, it felt like, you know, it was a surprise. So the way, I guess, practically speaking, the way it happened was after I'd published um, one of my books, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, which came out in 2010, it was a novel. It was my first novel and second book. I started working with an agent um, in like Hollywood and TV and film. And there, there wasn't like an immediate thought, like you should go try to change careers. It was more, they would set up these meetings where I got to get to know producers and executives, people that could actually potentially hire me for something or buy, buy something I'd written for film at a screen adaptation. And through one of these meetings, I met an executive at HBO. And so without realizing it, I guess he must have kind of put my name in consideration for a job on this HBO show. Um, but yeah, it just felt like dumb luck because actually I hadn't thought of that as a job. I thought if, if it would ever happen, it would be some big producer buys, you know, buys the rights to my book and, and then I can like quit my job. Uh, but it, it happened a different way, which was come work, you know, but that, that is a full-time job. So it became this kind of um, really big decision point. You know, this was 2014. We had moved from Santa Monica, uh, you know, to Irvine, which is in Orange County. It's much more suburban, uh, a lot of good Asian food in Irvine. And it's um, the main reason my wife and I moved is we, ha we have very good public schools here. And we have two kids that were getting to the age where it's like, can we afford private school? Do we want to do private school? And we really wanted to send our kids to public schools. I guess my wife and I both went to public school pretty much all the way through. Um, and so, um, so we had moved here and then all of a sudden it comes this job offer where I'd have to drive like four hours a day. Uh, but it was too good to pass up. Um, you know, the big question was like, do we have health insurance? And I would get it through the Writers Guild. So, so we did it. My parents were, you know, okay with it because my brother had been a TV writer for a few years already. So they knew that it was like, I wasn't chasing some, you know, some lottery ticket or something. They knew that that was a paycheck. <laughs> You can always go back to law, I guess. I mean, yeah. So, but one of the yeah. questions um, uh, came from the audience is, uh, and I think it kind of relates to your writing for, for um, uh, television. What did you uh, make the structure? Why did you make the structure of the story written as a teleplay? So did writing uh, uh, for television kind of influence this, uh, you know, the, the structure of the uh, interior Chinatown? Yeah. Um, um, yes. 
<laughs> yes to I think the structure really um, it, it was like the breakthrough for me um, because I I had known that I wanted to write about these kind of immigrant stories and these stories about like people trying to you know live their lives to assimilate and it didn't have a form you know like I had the, the substance I just didn't feel like I was saying anything interesting or insightful or I wasn't interesting myself through my writing so I but the script, what, what it did was it really became this kind of working metaphor or whole like cluster of metaphors about, I think the Asian American experience, you know, I think about feeling like marginalized, feeling otherized, feeling like you're part of a narrative that you have no control over and mostly doesn't care about you. And, you know, I think the script gave this um, really clear distinction between the performance by Willis and the other, you know, eight background Asians, their, their performance for, I guess, a mainstream audience, you know, outwards, outside of their community as Asians. And then their backstage lives, which is with each other, you know, where they're human beings and they have interior lives, but that stuff is never seen on screen. And I really wanted to capture both, but be able to move quickly and fluidly between front stage and backstage. Cause that the psychology of that, I feel like as someone born here, as you know, uh, it, depending on how you count a first or second generation American, that that was something I was trying to reflect through Willis of this sense of doubleness of feeling like I'm kind of, I present as Asian, but inside there's much more than that. And I don't even necessarily feel that, you know, I, I feel some, like I don't belong, you know, in, in sort of either, either place. So, um, so that's really what the script did for me. And I think, yeah, I probably would never would have either, it never would have occurred to me had I not started working in TV. And I also probably wouldn't have felt like I had the confidence to kind of play with the medium. But I think after having done it, you know, in a professional setting, I felt like, well, I think I think I can try this. Well, this is a, a related question uh, from the audience. Uh, in the book, uh, Willis <clears throat> Wu feels torn between his identity and the roles um, he's pressured to fill as an Asian American actor. Um, so have you experienced similar tension, like that expectation of you? Um, the, yeah, kind of that, who you are and what people expect you to be. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. It's a it's a great question. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think the most specific context I can think of is when I first started practicing as a lawyer. Um, it was you know um, at this fancy New York firm, which is um, in. And I was in the LA office, which was pretty small. And I just felt like I was going into an environment where I already had a little bit of imposter syndrome. You know, it's like a, a baby lawyer. I felt like I didn't, I wasn't totally equipped. You know, I kept looking around the room for the adult in the room. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm the person they're looking to, to advise them. Uh, and, and so that seemed crazy already. And then on top of that being you know, one of the only Asians, I mean, there were a couple of others, but it wasn't like there were a lot and there were no partners, you know, in, in the California offices that were Asian. And um, at that time, I think this was 20 years ago. So I, I assume things have changed on that front, but it, it just, it, it, from the beginning, I already felt like in that environment that I wasn't, that there was a ceiling on what I could be there, you know? And I, I often felt a little bit uncomfortable, like I was, I didn't quite belong, like I had snuck in. And I think this feeling of like being, I don't know. So, so I would spend a lot of time not at all thinking about being Asian. And then, and then every once in a while, I would become very sort of acutely conscious of it when, 
either someone would point it out, you know, like maybe not in like a hurtful context, just like, um, you know, just as an observation or something, or how do you feel or, I, and I did, you know, occasionally get comments too about just sort of being quiet, hardworking Asian guy. And I, I thought, wow, is that really how people see me? Is that how they're thinking about me? Like, cause I, uh, I'm not that I'm not walking around thinking about it myself, but I think that sense of like both thinking, I don't know that there's such a mismatch between how I see myself on the inside and how, how I was presenting, I guess, on the outside that um, I wanted to write about that. Well, I, if, when you were talking about quiet, hardworking Asian guy, I kind of see a, a law legal drama coming out here. <laughs> something. Well, from your own experience as a, you know, working in, in, in law for so long. Um, but I, you know, and you know, there were so many law uh, legal dramas and uh, uh, actually it's it hasn't been a while since we've seen a, Asian American lawyer has there. I, uh, I think Lucy Liu play one. I mean, so I see yeah, something. Right. Yeah, I, I, I see a future um, TV show there, and maybe you can be the head writer or something. Uh, you certainly bring your experience. But now I want to talk about representation. You grew up in in LA, and um, in in and you mentioned that growing up you didn't see that many um, Asian, uh, especially Asian act, uh, you know, actors. Uh, on television. And I remember um, hearing, I think the year they were going to make Around the World in 80 Day remake it. And they had announced um, Jackie Chan in the cast. And I just thought naively, oh, great, Around the World in 80 Day with Jackie Chan as the lead. And then only to find out that he's playing the sidekick again. Uh, so representation, it, it, you you know, how do you, uh, now I understand um, Interior Chinatown has been picked up for a, a series, right, with Hulu. So you get to write that. So has that, um, you know, it sounds like it, it's changing, correct? And, or, you know, how has that, um, uh, is Hollywood finally getting it? And maybe because uh, I want to kind of now talk about this more, the global uh, distribution in terms of the market, um, you know, with with uh, Netflix, Hulu, you know, the streaming service. And I, especially this year, um, can you imagine the the, the uh, pandemic without uh, Netflix this year, uh, or or watching you know all this programming on television, uh, and especially on on um, on, on uh, the streaming, uh, Amazon and all of that. So is is the representation finally? Uh, do you think Hollywood is getting it that it um, that there is a global audience? We you know we alluded to earlier about um, uh, the 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 videotapes of. Chinese dramas or, or Korean Hong Kong dramas uh, and, and all that. And then now with proliferation right now, you know, K, uh, K dramas, my parents, my mother uh, is obsessed with the, the Korean uh, drama and, and she learned to use the iPad because of <laughs> access to the, these uh, dramas. And um, so do you think um, this, I mean, I guess this globalization of content is I guess what I'm looking at. So do you think, um, you know, from where you're standing as a writer, um, is that, are you seeing that sw uh, change? Um, and, and what happened this year, is that gonna help uh, move that change uh, uh, faster uh, in terms of seeing a more Asian um, representation on, you know, in content? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> um, a, a few things come to mind, you know, I, I think one, it's pretty incredible, you know, starting with, I guess, with um, Bong Joon-ho winning, you know, all the, and Parasite winning a couple of years ago. And then of course this year with Chloe Zhao. And um, I mean, there's, you, you know, the, you know, Minati and, and uh, there's just been a kind of, uh, I don't know, a boomlet of, you know, of like awards recognition, I guess. Um, for and 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 then just beyond that there's been quite a few performers that have emerged you know ronnie chang and aquafina and uh simu liu is going to be a it's literally going to be a marvel hero and a superhero so we have uh asian superhero now in the marvel universe um it's hard to look at that and say well that's some kind of progress because even five years ago you know, that'd be hard to imagine. Um, it, 
And yet I'm old enough to have lived through a couple of the cycles where you felt like things were changing and then maybe not, right? Margaret Cho in you know, like the early 90s felt like, whoa, there's a show on ABC. Uh, Joy Luck Club even before that, I guess. Um, I do think this time is different. I think a couple of reasons you mentioned Netflix. There's so many streamers, you know, Interior Chinatown is at Hulu. I'm really lucky and happy to be working with them. There's all these places that need shows, so many shows. And um, that I, I feel like just the sheer number of shows means that there's more opportunities. But that alone wouldn't be enough because it also takes people wanting, I mean, they could, they could put on 500 legal dramas, right? <laughs> they could put on 500 shows that are not diverse. But at the same time, I, I feel like one thing that's happening behind the scenes a little bit is there are more directors and producers and executives, people that actually are gatekeepers and writers, you know, that want to tell those stories. And there are those people who will make, who will, you know, green light those stories, who will fund, finance the, the production of those things. And both Asian and non-Asian. I mean, I think within, there's people who are driving it from the inside and saying, I want to tell my story. But on the other side of that, there's a lot of people saying, I want to hear your story. And that really, it takes both sides of that. I mean, I, I guess I'm both an optimist and a pragmatist. I feel like it would be crazy to think it's just going to go up in a straight line from here. But I would, for my money, this time does feel different for what it's worth. Um, just be so curious to see how this, you know, next, I don't know, next kind of wave of, of Asian projects is received. Um, yeah. Well, I think you're you're right in that there you seem to be. I remember when Ang Lee won the Oscar, and and you know, uh, it, so it seems to be it used to be that you have pockets of talent, you know, the directors and all that. Uh, but this time, it seems to me there's kind of like a younger generation um, uh, stepping up. I mean, you know, the, you mentioned Chloe Zhao, and yesterday I was at a, a program listening to John Chu, who's in the height is coming out um, in 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 a few months. And so I think it seems to me there is a lot of, um, there is now a pool of talent. There seems to be a pipeline of talent. And one of the things I had always thought about with Hong Kong, um, Hong Kong made great movies. I think many of us grew up watching the Hong Kong movies, but then I wonder what happened. And I, I often felt the, 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 the key, and some people think film is about the director. Um, and I, I feel film has to be director and also writer. So now seeing you and, and also uh, Viet, uh, I think uh, Viet uh, Nguyen's uh, um, uh, sympathizer. I, I remember in in the book he mentions the uh, the, the 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 director, the the, the Hollywood director, um, you know, uh, making kind of like his version of Apocalypse Now, that kind of right. thing. And, right. and 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 the the Asian are the the, the bodies, the background, and, and 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 so I think it seems to me that is changing. There is a pipeline of writer, like you said, talent was always there. So hopefully that, and also maybe because of the market too, um, you, you know, you mentioned uh, Parasite and then also Minari, I have not seen it, but Minari is, is, a, is a Korean American story um, right. that, that is, it's, um, you know, getting a lot of recognition. So, so it seems to me, I hope anyway, but, uh, and I hope that, you know, that, that, that globalization, that content, because here, um, during the COVID, I mean, many of us are watching things on, on, you know, um, the, that the, the content is very important and to see, um, you know, good writing and, uh, um, uh, Lulu Wang, uh, I think has some projects out. Um, and yeah. uh, so it's, it's really exciting to see that th these younger, you know, uh, it used to be, you know, we work a lot with Janet Yang in Hollywood, Janet and Ang Lee, but then now there seems to be a younger generation stepping up to, Kind of take the mantle and move it uh, move it forward so i'm really happy and i hope to see more of your um, writing so tell us more about what are you uh you're working on interior uh chinatown you know for hulu but are you uh, how long one of the question was how long did the uh, project interior chinatown took uh, for you to to finish yeah um thank uh and it took um a really long time is the short answer. Um, I started writing in 2012 and I finished in early 2019. So it took almost seven years to write. And it's not a very long book. I, I think I calculated if I had written just 20 words a day, I would have finished in the same amount of time. 
So that's depressing. Uh, but, you know, it, sometimes it takes forever to get there. I, I hope the show doesn't take that long to write, but I, I can't. They won't wait that long. But, uh, yeah, I, I had a hard time writing this book. Um, and I wanted to jump back real quick to something we were just talking about. Um, you mentioned Lulu Wong's movie, The Farewell, which I really enjoyed. And I think it's such an interesting hybrid because obviously it takes place in China. And it's almost like this kind of reverse kind of coming home story, I guess, in a way, or going back to see her family. Um, and I think it's so interesting that to me, the there's, there's not a hard distinction, um, I guess, in some ways. Like Crazy Rich Asians was a movie set in Asia about Asians. Um, the Farewell was a little bit of a hybrid. It takes place in, in Asia, but it's sort of an Asian American, right? Or it is an Asian American. Um, and you mentioned, um, yeah, and yet, and then of course, K-dramas and Parasite, those are Asian movies taking place in Asia. I, for me, one exciting thing, I, this self-serving, is Asian American stories, specifically about that experience. Because I think there's a distinction, you know, an important distinction uh, for people that grew up here where I am and um, have strong ties and a strong desire to remember and celebrate their heritage and their ancestry and yet at the same time have such a different experience you know in terms of culture and language and psychology um and you know and so that to me is i look forward i hope to a wave of stories of that and and seeing what those look like um but and, and then i had to also throw out we had talked about hong kong film um I watched Wong Kar Wai's movies for the first time at Berkeley, and that had a deep and lasting effect. I mean, I think he's still my favorite filmmaker. And um, uh, I, I think it's hard to overestimate the effect that Hong Kong cinema has had. You know, I mean, I think we were talking even about like when you talk about um, like Infernal Affairs or other crime or, you know, um, crime related movies um do you, you, I, I feel like you can't really turn on american action movies and not see it all over i mean in style in content you know and so um yeah i don't know i had to say that <laughs> no, no i think you're right i think infernal affair i think is by far superior than uh departed but departed <laughs> won the oscar right so you know we uh, they often say uh, the you know um Asians copy others, right? Uh, but in that movie, it's, you know, uh, the way even down to the backpipe, um, Scorsese copied uh, uh, Infernal Affairs. So I think in, in many ways, um, but one of the interesting in thing with, um, especially with Minari was the talent, you know, uh, 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 Korean American working with Korean actors, um, Korean talent, so this kind of, um, this, this mix of talent. Um, and you said they're Asians and Asian American, but you know, the border we cross back and forth. So why not? Um, right. uh, uh, and, and Farewell is a good example of that. Uh, but did your, uh, I often, the way I gauge the success of a movie is Farewell, I took my parents to go see it and they loved it uh, because most of the half the movies in Mandarin, right? And then my <laughs> sister who's, who's, who's more like you grew up in the States, also loved it. So that's how I gauge when a film can appeal to um, Asians or Asian American Asians. And, you know, that's a success right there. And don't you think sometimes we Asian American kind of box us in? You mentioned um, Interior Chinatown in there at this mental ghetto. Um, boxing us, you know, the boxing, it, 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 talk a bit about that mental ghetto, um, you know, Willis has to kind of make that realization that he sometimes puts himself in that box rather than um, you know his own baggage I think as you mentioned I think in a previous interview or something like that yeah yeah that's it's a big part of the book is is that one of the things that becomes clear um, to Willis is that he has put a lot of limitations on himself you know not to say that there isn't real discrimination and, and that he hasn't been limited by others because of his race, but that he's internalized them at the same time. I don't think it, 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 it's, it's not mutually exclusive. He, he can also have internalized them to such a degree that they 
that he's holding himself back. And that's, that's definitely a feature of um, what I feel like is for some Asian Americans, a feature of feeling like growing up knowing that, or, or never seeing models for you, never seeing certain pathways open or seeing a limit, you know, yeah, whether it's in sports, you know, um, you know, I was on a panel recently with Jeremy Lin, which was kind of amazing to be talking to him. And he talked about that a lot, you know, that how, and, um, or, you know, whether it's in sports or in entertainment, in, in a lot of these kind of high visibility fields, uh, there's just such a rarity, or at least for someone my age, such a rarity to see that I think it has a real distorting effect on the psyche. And I, there's an, you know, last night I was talking to a filmmaker, Arthur Dong, who read this, made this documentary, Hollywood, Hollywood Chinese. And in that documentary, he has an interview with Ang Lee where Ang Lee says this amazing thing, which in, when you actually say it, it doesn't necessarily sound like so shocking, but it was a real epiphany for me when he said it, which was, you know, there, one of the, I think Arthur had asked him a question, like, why do you think some of like filmmakers like Ang Lee and others had broken through in a way that maybe Asian Americans hadn't. He's like, because they, they're from Asia. They don't think of themselves in the same way. They grew up there, you know, connected to their culture, to their um, foundation. Whereas I think, you know, I'll, I'll speak for myself. For me growing up Asian American, sometimes it felt like, um, you know, I didn't have that base of strength or confidence to draw on. I felt neither Asian enough nor American enough. And um, yeah, that's, that's one thing, I think a feature of both Willis and, and, and me. Well, that, this, this fits very well with this question about how do you define Asian American identity? What makes it Asian American um, culturally, socially, and historically? And we also, you, in some of the interview, you mentioned you're Taiwanese uh, American. And, and I often wonder about, and I, kind of calls myself Chinese American, but now there seems to be this Asian American um, movement. And I, unfortunately it's because of the, all the anti-Asian hate. Um, and growing up in the States, I often wonder, you know, we box ourselves in our own community, the Korean American, the Chinese American, the Indian American. We sometimes, even though we have similar experience, but we don't really talk to each other. Um, mm -hmm. So this birth of this Asian Americanness, and I think it started with Vincent Chin even back then uh, when he was killed, he was mistaken for being a Japanese American during the, the um, back then with the Japanese investing um, in, in the United States. And I, growing up in the Midwest, um, we, we were very much aware of that. So, so that cultural identity of Asian Americanness has been there, but it's not been kind of, it's been on the back drop. I mean, we, we use that as a kind of a default, but it has, it seems to me it's coming forward now um, mm -hmm. more. And, and um, I'm going to be hearing a talk with uh, Jerry Yang, who, along with others, have started this Asian American um, uh, uh, Federation, I guess, you know, in some ways to come back to, hey, it, it takes a crisis like that for us to emerge um, with this Asian American identity. So how do you kind of define the Asian American identity? And, and you know, culturally, socially, and historically? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things, you know, going back to the first part of your comment, I think it is really true that there's a fluidity now that feels different. You know, I, I don't know, I, I, I can't, I, I don't know all the complexities of it, but it feels like part of it is just, it's easier to travel back and forth, but there's also a lot more people who spend time sort of, you know, um, without necessarily one very definite home base or they don't think of it that way. And so it gets blurrier, I think. And that's a really, um, it's really interesting and complex. Um, uh, for me, yeah, I, I, I feel like I grew up, um, you know, being, uh, you know, um, I guess, I, I don't know how I grew up. Uh, I, I'm not sure I used the term Asian American until Berkeley. You know, that, that's probably the first time I, oh, what's, what is that? You know, I mean, there are all these student associations, right? Like most undergrads, you walk on a campus and there's all these tables and there's a club for everything. And you're right. There, there's a club for like Korean American hip hop or whatever. And then there's um, Chinese American 
you know, tennis. And then there's just a club for everything. And then there were some umbrella organizations. And then another place where I encountered it even more so was law school at Columbia, where there's, you know, most law schools, I think, will have an, an APALSA, which is Asian Pacific American Law Students Association. So I was a member of that. And I think that's really kind of the first place because Berkeley had so many Asians, uh, you know, close to 40 percent. And it's such a big campus that, um, I don't know, I guess that kind of subdivision is easier when there's so many people. And not to say I hung out only with like my kind, it, not at all, actually. But um, I think something about being in New York in a much smaller community that was less Asian percentage wise felt like, oh, there's a need. I, I get the need for this, even though, yeah, there's. Koreans and Vietnamese and, um, you know, um, uh, we, and we don't all necessarily have exactly the same experience um, that, that I understood since there's only, I don't know, a couple dozen of us in each class wanting to sort of have a network. So, um, and I feel like you're right that the reason it's coming back right now is out of necessity because it's it goes to you know you know it goes yeah all the way well it goes all the way back to the beginning of this conflation of the other of the orient right so you can take all east asians and probably a lot of southeast asians who present physically a certain way and just say that's one thing usually chinese that's the sort of like umbrella thing it's like oh you're chinese maybe japanese um and so it's almost like, to me, a, a flipping of that power. It's like reclaiming it. Okay, if you're going to see us all as one thing, then let's be one thing. You know, let's aggregate our numbers and use that for political, economic, and social, you know, clout, if, if that's possible. So it, it feels like a good leveraging of like, you know, like the inversion of the discrimination is to go, all right, <laughs> you know, uh, so, yeah. Um, a, one of the questions from the audience is interesting because you, you said you grew up in um, L.A. and I grew up in the Midwest and, you know, minority, you know, there was no uh, other Asians in my in high school except myself and my uh, and the, maybe two other. Um, so I grew up very much a minority, but I never felt like the other. But I'm also curious with my friends and I lived in New York for nine years uh, before coming back to Hong Kong uh, about 10 years ago. And New York, uh, and having worked in Chinatown in New York too, I just feel like in New York, you know, there is again the boxing of 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 the the, the identity. Um, and so I'm curious. One of the questions from the audience is, do you have struggles um, living in the United States as a Chinese American? I mean, your struggle, if, if there is, I mean, I mean, your parents, my parents, that generation is different struggle. But did you, uh, growing up, at, you're, you're American-born Chinese, um, have struggles? Um, living um, as a Chinese American? Um, I have, um, it's weird, you know, like, I, I, I think if when you, uh, if, if I'm like stepping back, compared to pretty much anyone else, I feel very lucky, you know, like I didn't endure a lot of explicit discrimination. I, I can only think offhand of a few incidents of that, both growing up and maybe as an adult as well, there've been, you know, there've been times, sure. People have called me things or said things or, um, uh, but I, 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 I also don't know, you know, I'm not sure that I, I feel like another thing that I really identify with Willis, which is a weird way to put it since I created <laughs> Willis, but uh, you know, is, this um, internalization. Uh, I feel like in some ways, for whatever reason, I really wanted to blend in. I really wanted to be invisible. And that meant like scrubbing off anything I could. I, obviously I can't change. And I, not to say I wanted to not be Asian, but I felt like, um, yeah, I really, was trying to not make waves for, for most of growing up and even into adulthood. And I think 
so that's how I would describe it. And, and so, yeah, at the same time that I can feel very privileged, I also feel like it has had an effect on me to feel like I wasn't going to be accepted or I, I could only accomplish so much. Um, we're coming uh, down to five more minutes ago, but we still have a few questions I want to get through. Um, and one of the uh, good question from the audience is, that, have you considered uh, writing a book about yourself uh, in your story uh, uh, instead of, you know, like a memoir instead of a fiction story? Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, I'll try not to be so wordy. Yeah, because I always don't get through enough questions because I take forever. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't the, think anyone. You, you can take all the time you want. I, I it's sometimes the short answer. Sometimes I, I'm 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 not a fan of the Twitter uh, things, but please take as okay. much time as you need. <laughs> it's true. That's why I feel like this conversation. It's like there's certain things you can only say in a this format. Um, it. Uh, I have not thought about that. Uh, I appreciate it. I feel like I am such a boring person. <laughs> like uh, it has to be fiction. On the other hand. I do really enjoy writing nonfiction. You know, I, I've written a few essays, especially in the last year or so, and I I like it. It's just as hard as fiction, but um, I don't know. I, I feel like I'd want to write about someone else if I if I could. I don't know who yet. Uh, maybe your parents. Any maybe. thought? Maybe, maybe, yeah. Um, one. Yeah. So um, this is a technical question, and this is coming from uh, Karen. My my book club buddy, um, she said, I truly enjoy listening to uh, Interior Chinatown on Audible. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, as an author on listening versus reading the book? Um, is Are points missed when listening? Yeah, uh, my thoughts are, you know, one, I have an Audible subscription. So I am definitely a, a user of audiobooks. Um, and I find personally that nonfiction, I, I prefer, I mean, I don't, I think I prefer reading to any form, but there are certain books that I know I probably will never pick up unless I just listen to it. Like I'm not, this is an excuse, but I, with two kids and a job, I'm like, I'm not going to read the 600 page history book, but I'll listen to it. Um, so there's that. Uh, and yeah, I don't know if for me, there is something, the reason why I still prefer physical books is, you know, I don't think, for me, I, I don't read down the page, right? I kind of in a looping fashion where I, I, I realize, oh, I kind of missed something. I got to go back up. That's, you can't do that in audiobook. I think you can't really even do an ebook as well. I think there's something about holding a physical thing and having it. So I, I don't, but that said, uh, I would rather have read a book and I would rather people have read the book than not read it at all. And sometimes the audiobook, especially when the narrator is good, you know, um, adds adds something to it so i think yeah i'm all for it well um i'm a uh time because of time i have to say i i most of the books lately i've been doing it on audible because you can um exercise and listen at the same time or even podcast i think right now podcasting is also something that is really taking off as well so i i but to be to confess to prepare for this interview i wanted to go back and um highlight passages but because it was on audible <laughs> I, I couldn't do that so last night i'm like and i thought about downloading the book and one of the things that i think i do now is buy the book download it because because here in hong kong space um as much as i'd love to buy books i still love browsing bookstores um but it's 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 the so everything is on on kindle and uh but it is, you're right, it is different from reading a book. Um, but one of the questions that, that I wanna ask you, uh, kind of ending on that is uh, library cards. I think, you know, did you grow up going to libraries when you were when you were kids? Because right now, again, explain, you know, libraries. I, for me, uh, my parents, uh, they work in a Chinese restaurant and as a kid, they dump us in uh, uh, the, the library, which was very close to our restaurant. So I remember growing up just loving libraries. And, and, uh, and, but with you, I mean, how about, you know, did you grow up with library bookstores? Um, and what are some of the books that influence you as a young, uh, as a young person? Yeah, um, I did grow up with libraries. I remember applying for a library card and getting really excited. And it's like, oh, I can just go get these. and <laughs> They don't charge us anything. Uh, and then for a while, when my mom was working, um, my brother and I would get dropped off at the library after school, or actually, no, sorry, we'd have to walk to the library and spend several hours there until my mom was done with work so 
the, it was kind of a after school hangout slash babysitter for a long time. So, um, and you know, we, when we moved here to Irvine, we got, you know, Orange County public library, library cards for our kids. We haven't been back very much, but, uh, uh, I, I, I um, yeah, I, I love libraries. Same with bookstores. I remember when there were bookstores in malls, <laughs> you know, that was a thing. And, and then, uh, in independent bookstores, there used to be several in Southern California, and now there really aren't many, especially especially where I live in Orange County. So Barnes and Noble is the closest I have to a, it. And it kind of feels like, even though that's a big chain, feels like an indie underdog compared to Amazon now. So um, and I just miss physical bookstores so much for, for the last year and a half or so that you know we haven't been able to go to them. Or so um, yeah, I I I grew up reading you know, comic books. I grew up reading some science fiction, Ray Bradbury, um, Isaac Asimov. Um, I read those choose your own adventure books that were really popular when I was in elementary school. Uh, I think that probably had some influence on like just how they play with form and structure, you know, how they uh, are kind of, um, they're all kind of existential because it's like, oh, what if I hadn't made that choice? <laughs> so uh, I read, yeah. And I read a lot of like science, like I love those books where they'd collect like 5,000 facts because I, you know, just love that. So, and now my son really loves those kinds of books too. So. So what if your son comes to you and said he wants to be a writer? What, what advice would you give him? <laughs> um, uh, I would say don't quit your day job. No, I, I would say uh, I would be really proud and excited and a little worried because I'm mean, well with that's going to come a lot of rejection and it's going to come possibly a lot of self-doubt but it also I don't know I'd almost feel like I had passed on some kind of genetic curse <laughs> <laughs> but I would I would try to help him in any way I could I mean there's only so much I can do I, I I'd, I'd want to read his work I guess and I'd be really afraid that he'd be like there'd be all these terrible father figures in his books <laughs> I'd be like oh no <laughs> Your, your worst nightmare come true. Um, but thank you, Charles. I am so delighted that um, I, was, I, I wanted to really have a chance to talk to you because the book, um, it seems to me there is kind of this renaissance of uh, Asian or Asian American writers. Um, you know, we, we, in our book club, we have read Celeste, mm, we have read Si Pam Tsung, we read Viet Nguyen, um, and as well as others, of course. But I think, uh, I think, in my life, I mean, I remember, in fact, I just saw the Amy Tan documentary uh, the other night and uh, being, remember reading uh, Amy Tan, um, Joy Luck Club for the first time uh, and, and how universal uh, her, her, you know, her writing was. And so it's now to see this group of you, I mean, and I look forward to um, reading more. So one of the questions I'm going to end is, uh, what next? What are you, uh, are you working on uh, the Hulu project or are you For now, it's mostly the Hulu project and some other TV and film stuff that I, you know, have been working on for a while now. I really hope to start a book soon, like this year, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm still searching, I think, for what that thing is going to be because I'm going to end up spending years of my life with it, so I better like it. Well, Charles, thank you so much uh, for um, spending the time with us. And, uh, and, and for those of you who um, enjoyed today's program, Charles is going to speak with Asia Society New York as part of the um, Asia Society Triennial on, I think, on May 20th. And so you have another opportunity uh, to listen to Charles on the uh, part of the Asia Society Global Network. So thank you. Thank you for spending the time with us. And uh, Thank you, um, our online audience. And it's so glad, to, I'm so happy to be back. I'm gonna be out of quarantine soon. Uh, we're gonna do bring you back more programs uh, like this. And in fact, I think in talking to Charles uh, kind of gave me the idea to invite Bonnie uh, to, to talk about that that Chinatown book, because I remember um, it was a really interesting uh, book when it first came out, I think it was 2009. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll see what Bonnie's up to, but thank you and and keep on reading. I think um, this pandemic uh, if without books, um, I think more booked more than uh, watching streaming, I have to say has really gotten us, uh, especially my wonderful book club through this, um, 
uh, pandemic. And I think it doesn't look like we're out of the woods yet uh, because until vaccine is all taken up by everyone, please go and get vaccinated. Uh, until that happens, I think we still have, um, we're still gonna be confined uh, for a while. So pick up a good book and, and join a book club and be, you know, tune in on Asia Society. We're gonna bring you a lot more uh, authors, uh, and not just Asia Society Hong Kong, but Asia Society globally. And I wanted to now tell you more about our, um, join us on June 8th when Asia Society uh, Hong Kong will have our arts and culture online um, virtual gala. And with it, we will have artists, Asian uh, and Asian American artists and artists donating uh, their work uh, about 40, almost 50 artists uh, donating their work. Uh, we're gonna have an auction uh, at, starting on May 21st and we'll end the auction on June 8th. We need to raise some money. Uh, it's been a difficult year for all of us. And but we will continue to bring you programs like this and uh, please join us uh, for the um, art auction as well as the arts and, Asia's arts and cultural benefit on June 8th. And thank you for being with us uh, this morning. Thank you so much.